Welcome to Just Meds, a life-changing program that resonates hope as well as encouragement. The program gives you information and inspiration for the glory of God. I'm your host, Jeff Tate, and thank you for joining Just Meds. On today's program, we have a very special guest. This is his first time being on Just Meds. Please welcome Robert Saunders. Brother Saunders, hey, welcome to Just Meds. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Oh, this man. is awesome. Man, I tell you, we are so elated to have you on our program. And let me say on the onset, you add value to just men. And mm. we're really going to dive into to your discovery of your significance and your value in, in various ways that God has touched your life. But before we dive into the, the pages of your life, just share a quick bio on who is Robert Saunders. Um, well, first of all, I know I'm a man of God, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, driven by his passion. I know that for sure, I'm solid. And another thing, I'm a husband, I'm a brother, I'm a friend, um, but I'm a proclaimer of truth. And whatever God says is truth is, is what I'm talking about to anybody I can. So um, that's who I am. I, I, I identify myself in the Lord Jesus Christ and not in, not, in, uh, not in what the world thinks I should be, but who he says I am. So that's who I am. Mm. You know, there's a lot of affirmation in, in your identity, and I really want to kind of pull the pages back and talk a little bit about uh, in terms of how did you come to that point of understanding who you are and understanding the love of God and, and just reflecting on that from the adolescence, from the childhood to adolescence and just the birthing of this, this, this identity, this, this firmness of who you are in God. I think sometimes people get confused that when he said that he will baptize you both by fire and the Holy Spirit, that that comes sometime after your salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I believe that in my life, particularly, my baptism with fire came before my identity in him because it comes out of turmoil and sorrow and um, unhappiness. Um, for example, as a youth or a very young child, uh, three uh, years old, my mom abandoned us. She was a severe alcoholic. So she left the home a couple of times. My sister and I, uh, she was a year younger, two years younger than me, and uh, she left us. And so what happened was, and I thought it was a really confusing story, like she just goes to the bar and they're like, where's, where's your mom or that says that to my dad? And he runs home and we're all, uh, we have uh, suffered mon carbon monoxide poisoning. So they rush us to the hospital. We survived that obviously. <laughs> so here we are. Well. She, she and my dad divorced, and then I didn't know until years later, but my grandfather, my, my paternal grandfather, uh, had my dad give us away to the state. So we had three foster homes in two years, so, um, which were very confusing times because back then, foster homes I don't believe were anything like they are today. I've met a lot of foster parents today. They're loving, kind, generous. Um, back then, you were a number, you were a check, you were, you were nobody, you're less than. In one of the foster homes, we had, to, we had to stay in the room until the family ate. Then we could come out and eat. Mm. And that's a hard thing for a child to get a grip on. But I think the Lord had put in me a spirit of optimism. I stayed optimistic about life for some reason. Um, we come back home, and there was beatings and uh, molestations. And, then, um, and that went on for a long time. And then uh, January of 72, my sister was four and I was just uh, turned seven and she died in my arms uh, from an illness that she had had and that uh, I went catatonic for a year and a half um, I don't remember moving <laughs> I was just shut out and I didn't shut down they said I, I lost a whole year of school and um, I became angry and bitter um, vengeful even at that young of an age so as I got a little bit older by the time I hit 14 I had no identity. My identity would come from you or the girlfriend or the school teacher. I excelled in things like school and sports because I got that pat on the back. I never got it home. So I looked for my identity in all that. So at 14, uh, the pain was so bad, um, I went to alcohol and drugs um, severely at that age. By 19, I was a full-blown alcoholic. Already knew it. So I'm hiding, and I think the, the sometimes that I didn't want to come out of that numbness, um, because that become my reality, is I didn't want to. 
I didn't want to deal with the pain. I didn't know what to do with pain. It, it, was, a, it was baffling to me. So um, I'm angry <laughs> at everybody and very, very, very uh, unassured of myself, low self-esteem, except in a couple arenas. Again, education and sports was my arena for uh, acceptance. So I went after it with everything I had. And I had to do whatever I could to get out of the house as fast as I could. So I dropped out of high school. Um, had problems get, and I got in the Army, had problems getting, a, getting staying in the Army. Um, my identity was all blowed up. Um, again, drinking and all that was a problem. So by the time I hit 21, I, prob I was just got married. And I was, um, uh, that was, that was a new identity. It was a different kind of identity. And uh, we had marital problems right off the jump. And I, I won't ever pass the buck. I did my part. Um, so uh, I'm still drinking, hiding it, um, and doing all that. So I'm still mad, though. And then I separated from my family. I ran from them as long as I could, as hard, as fast as I could get away from them, and uh, just abandoned them for like 15 years. Didn't want anything to do with them. So this is a roller coaster life, five marriages, destroyed lives all along the way, in and out of jail, prison. And uh, I say probably around my 40s, early 40s, uh, I was so angry and so bent on revenge that um, I, I, just, I just couldn't live anymore. I was just going to kill myself, be done with it and uh, had a plan, ended up in a hospital, uh, ended up in a, in a, 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 a detox center. <laughs> and so, because I was really, really out there and just emotionally out there and a lot of stuff going on. And that last time, June 8, 2008, 43 and a half. And God, I'm standing in line in a, in a jail cell waiting for breakfast, Sunday morning, 5 a.m. Now, the thing about me and God I didn't know anything about Jesus, though. I mean, nobody really talked about him to me. And uh, God, I feared God. I, here's what I thought. I thought, here's this all-powerful something <laughs> that's just waiting to squash me because I'm good for nothing, because that's all I've ever been told. And now I believe that about myself uh, wholeheartedly because, I mean, I'm a, I'm a business guy, but I'm in and out of jail, uh, committing uh, offenses, and, and I'm constantly in and out of that legal battle. And here I am in another jail cell, and God showed up. Now, I don't know nothing about, no, I didn't know anything about scripture. Um, <laughs> I always tell a funny story that uh, sporting events, they'd hold the sign, John 316, and I'd have to ask, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? Why would they have this sign? I don't even know that God so loved the world, right? So um, I'm just standing there. Uh, I went into jail, that was Friday night, I went into jail, really, 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 really intoxicated. And I don't remember Saturday at all. It doesn't even exist in my memory banks. Like it just, it's a page of my life that was kind of like when I went catatonic. I don't remember those days. So here I am, standing at the 12th man in line, interesting number, 12. And uh, three days, I felt like I was in a tomb. <laughs> uh, so God shows up. Now jails are really noisy places, aren't they? I mean, they're incredibly noisy and it got deadly quiet. And there was uh, bright lights, but all of a sudden there was just bright light on me. And, and then I hear this, look on the ground behind you. So I just did one of those things. And I look back and I'm like, I saw as plain as I'm looking at you, this crushed down body, kind of like this accordion that I envisioned from Wile E. Coyote getting smushed by a boulder. And it had a big old head on it and blacked out eye sockets, but the face was me. That was me laying there dead. And as soon as that registered, God said, I'm either putting you back in that or you're coming with me. Yeah. And I never looked back. I never let go. My, uh, when I went in that jail cell, I was addicted to cigarettes for many, 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 many years, pack and a half, two packs a day. I couldn't get past 10 o'clock of the morning without drinking. Um, I just couldn't. 
physically, mentally, emotionally. I just could not get past that ever. Tried 100,000 different things. And I had uh, emphysema and real bad bipolar. And it's all of a sudden, oh, and anger and bitterness was gone. Mm. It, instantly I was healed. And I mean, the doctors wouldn't even see me. And I had, uh, I, I mean, I was just instantly 100% okay. I mean, not another craving, not another issue, no withdrawals from medicine, nothing. No withdrawal, no detoxing problems, just pure healing. And I just moved, gravitated from that spot to a Bible that was sitting on the other side of the room. This big, this big man come up and he goes, that's my Bible. I just <laughs> Where can I get one? I never, I never wanted to read the Bible. Now I couldn't put it down. Mm -hmm. So I, I dove into the word and I call it feasting. I didn't go after milk. I spent 30 days just in Psalms, just saturating in Psalms and praying the prayers of Psalms. And, um, and I learned about a man named Jacob who wrestled with God and man and he prevailed. And I thought I dove into that. And, and then one night I tried to wrestle with God and man for all night long and fell asleep and woke up convicted like, Felt like I just let him down, you know, I'm just worthless. And he came to me and he's like, no, you're fine. Thanks for trying. <laughs> you know, that kind of was just perfectly okay. Mm. Well, I look back on my life at that. I started looking back and I started thinking about all that hate and all that vengeance. And it wasn't even the scripture, Vincent's his mind says the Lord. It wasn't even that. It was, I just don't hate anymore. I love, and it's, to me it was ridiculous. I'm like, who am I to love anybody? And then I found out it was the agape love, mm -hmm. the logos word uh, in the beginning was the word, and that word was now starting to uh, thrive in me. So I started, I was under my blanket, praying and crying out to God. I mean, just slobbering all over myself. And I said, why didn't anybody ever tell me that I, that you love me. And he goes, that's what you're gonna tell him. And I knew my calling. Mm -hmm. And it was simple from that point on. All I knew then was, and then I read where, Jer where Isaiah was the sixth chapter of Isaiah, and he had had a rough ministry life up to that point, and God stopped everything. And they, he said, oh, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I could identify, and oh, I'm a man of un people of unclean lips, and, and that, that coal on his lips, and it just seared him. And, and then God said, who shall we send? And he goes, here am I, send me. And I'm like, yes, that's me. Just use me up. Mm -hmm. I don't care where, I don't care how long, I don't care for what, just use me up, I'm done. And then I didn't know it, but some couple years later, I would arrive in Romans chapter six, and I have been crucified. I said, Romans chapter 6 is like, because uh, I went through this identity from hate to love was written out of this passion of, of a story of a young couple kids, and I was one of them, and I changed a lot to protect my family and, and so on, but the story um, goes through all of that where he was hateful and vengeful, and turns out gets salvation and Eventually, he goes back and sees his mom in prison and, and loves on her until she dies. And, but the big question was, is who am I to God? Mm -hmm. And why would he love me? That was what was thriving inside of me. So, and then people were asking me questions like that. Well, who, would I, who am I to God? I'm just, a, I'm just an old has-been. I'm, you know, I'm always in and out of jail or I'm always in and out of trouble. And, and I started realizing in prayer and searching and reading the scriptures and praying through the scriptures and, and crying out to God, there's got to be an answer. He took me back to the beginning. And the number one question I always ask is, who made who? So I go back and I look for the answer. And in the beginning, God said, let there be. And then it gets to that point where he said, let us make man. And then I realized that out of all of what God made by the breath of his mouth from his faith, he spoke all these things except us. And this is where I get so passionate is because he got down off his throne and into the dirt and he shaped us. And then when he breathed us, it's not, it, we were created 
to be perfect. That's how that's our that's our natural state of being is perfection in him because he first was in us. And I'm like, so the cross is bringing us through the death, burial and resurrection. And it's simple to me. He goes to the cross, not with a backpack of trinkets of the deeds I've done, but he goes with the nature of the sin. That's what the word sin means. It's the nature of sin. That's what he put to death. So that nature that was in me that shook my fist at God and said, I'll be God, thank you very much. He killed it, buried it, put it to death. But when I was raised up and raised up in him, hey, that's my identity. So I found out that in the beginning, that's the way he originally planned it. So my identity has to go back to what's natural. So the only way to live a natural life is in Christ, in Christ in me, the hope of glory. So Paul says to the Colossian church that this mystery that I thought was a mystery and everybody, that Christ be in you, the hope of glory. And then he said in, to Ephesians church that, hey, guess what? You're seated in Christ. Chapter two, verse six, you're in Christ. That's the in Christ letter, right? You're seated in Christ at the right hand of power. And I go, there's my spiritual identity. Mm -hmm. That's who we are. The glory of God shines through us outward to others. And they just all of a sudden he just spills out all over himself. And then the glory of God just shines and people just raise up out of the deadness of their spirits, the deadness of their chains and their bondage. And I have seen that happen. So my encouragement is, oh, my, if you just dive into God through Christ into the person of who he is, and just let everything else go. He'll flip your life around so fast your head will spin. I mean, it's just crazy good. <laughs> well, you've, um, <clears throat> you've blessed me. Um, an opening question. <laughs> 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 and uh, to, to go full course, I don't know how you, you were able to capture all that but the Spirit of God. And you really left nothing undone uh, other than just the, I want to talk to you about the application of God's love and the, mm. the essence of who you are to God, how is that reflected in your life? Uh, and we'll start with uh, where you started with, and that is in relationships. Many times I know that when we have these brilliant awakening and accounting with, uh, an encounter with God, religion will constantly pull on that because it says, I am the gatekeeper mm. to your knowledge. I am the sort of the tree, mm -hmm. the tree that represent the knowledge of good and evil. And you come to this, this uh, sort of dichotomy or this, this, this parallel way of thinking that there are opposites that are going on that's inside of you, but you've only learned that through my venue, right? And many times people don't understand that the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was not part of the tree of life. Correct. There were two different trees. Correct. And, and so sometimes religion will give us just the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but not give us life. And so you had to start discovering the mm -hmm. tree of life outside of the parameters many times that religion uses. And so, but in order to do that, and here's my bridge, in order to do that, it gets to relationships. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about your relationships uh, in terms of how you've seen the power of God come out of the book, come off the pages, and then reflect it in your relationships. And how did those relationships change as a result of your encounter with God? Um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And that word that they came up with for the Greek language, the word logos, is very unique, and it set us apart for just Christ alone, Jesus himself because they had rhema, but that just was just us talking then or something we wrote down. But logos was specific to the nature of God, mm. which comes out of who he is. And since John wrote both first and, and well, in, in the, uh, the apostle John wrote the gospel of John as well as the first three epistles, right? Well, in the first epistle, he says, God is love. Mm. So God isn't that isn't an attribute of God. It is his nature. It's the essence of his existence is love. Well, we can't, as a person, uh, wholeheartedly get a hold of that. So we have to rely on uh, God to do that. So, well, to wrap that up, what I was saying is, is that for me, he crawls inside 
and he does the nature change. He crucifies that hate, that bitterness, that rage, that, hey, I'm going to protect mine. Get, here's my wall. I'll look over it, but that's it. Uh, trust level. And he shatters that. I mean, he just blows that away. That word dunamis in Romans chapter 6 means blowed up, destroyed. So he takes and changes the nature to his nature because we're raised up in him, right? So now I can love without conditions because it's not me that I don't have anything to fear in Christ um, because whatever he decides to do is already all right with me. And so the love that comes out of me is only his expression. I'm just the vessel. Um, he uses in John 15, Jesus was talking about the vine and the branch. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branch. Um, I just love when you fast forward about verse 7, he says, therefore you can do nothing without me. And uh, I'm not a smart man, but one thing I learned was if he says I can't do anything without him, then why would I even try? Mm -hmm. So I look at religion, I go, that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I look at relationships and I go, that's a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And relationship means he moves, I move. He breathes, I breathe. He mm -hmm. speaks, I speak. Mm -hmm. So therefore I ceased from my efforts. And I walk in the power and the, in, in the influence of the Holy Spirit. So I remember in one of your episodes, you talked to a man about the, the energy level that it takes. And I'm like, oh, I have some of the craziest, most ridiculous hours of a day in ministry. My phone could ring at 3 o'clock in the morning. My phone has rung at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and it's awesome, that power of that energy level, that compassion for... Because I'm looking at people I could see myself not many years ago. And I'm saying, but through Christ, all things are possible. So it's him changing the nature that allows us to spill out his glory. So th that's where that comes from. Mm. It comes from him changing us one person at a time kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. You know, uh, one of the things, and I know you and I kind of briefly uh, talk about is some of the brokenness that needs to be repaired through the Spirit of God and how we are the vessel mm -hmm. to bring about that repair. And you mentioned that even in the opening about the love repairment, uh, that why haven't I learned about your love for me? I know about your, the, um, the, the sort of the conviction or the sort of the, the judgment. Yeah. And a mm -hmm. huge part of judgment, a lot of the brokenness comes out of judgment and maybe even through a religious judgment as though it's, it's justified to have that judgment because of the, the religion part of it. How do you break through that, especially when you are getting those calls and how do you uh, get to the, the heart of, of people to express that love beyond you know, what they've experienced in life and what they've been taught and, and what religion may have, have conditioned them to believe what love is? How do you, how do you make that shift? in the hearts and minds of people? Um, it comes through uh, encouraging that God, first of all, th religion says God's mad at you because you're, bis you're misbehaving mm. or you're this or you're that. And they point that bony finger. And uh, one pastor friend of mine taught me this extension of a finger really gets long <laughs> on my righteousness. <laughs> and I think about that a lot. And I, and I, I back way up. I'm like, this isn't my place to judge anything. Mm. God is the judge of that. My part in all this is to set aside my own opinion and uh, look at it through, an, and the passage that came to mind as soon as you said that was the woman caught in adultery, mm. drug in there by her hair. I know everybody goes, well, what'd they do with the man? You know, but forget all that. We're dealing with the woman, and this is a lot of these guys or something that would call me uh, late at night and they've already, they've already messed up or whatever. And they're, they're, I would trust that they're calling me not to be chastised because the world will do enough of that. They're doing enough of that. But again, love doesn't condone wrong. It corrects wrong. So first thing I have to do is help them to understand, first of all, God isn't mad at you. So that's religion. Uh, God loves you in spite of you. But that doesn't make an excuse. Now, I understand addictions. I've studied addictions for over five years now, severe, seriously, and, and wrote courses on it. So I understand what's going on with the human mind in addiction. But that is a terrible trap of the enemy to get past. Mm -hmm. So I ask God in prayer to go to their heart, which actually is the, not the heart pumper, 
the blood pumper, mm -hmm. but the totality of their essence, the mind, the will, the emotions, all colliding with thoughts and desires and wants and needs, all coming together is the heart of man. And I realize that what's coming out of them at that moment isn't really them. Because if they're created in the image of God, which they were, then I have to know that behind all of that, and I look at it as, here's, here's the front of it, and then here's the back of it. I gotta get through that to see who they are mm -hmm. as Christ looks at them. So the woman drawn in there by, or thrown in there at the midst of his feet by, by the head of her hair, he looked at her and judged her not. He just, he said, well, I don't judge you either, so go. And I think about the man at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter five, and he said, it's the only time we see where it wasn't the man that came to Jesus asking for something. It was Jesus walked up to the man and said, hmm, do you want to be made well? Mm -hmm. And I've used that a lot in some of these classes because um, it, 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 the question is profound. You know, do you want to be made well? And he started with the same thing most people do, the excuses and well, you know, so I'm really amazed at what God can do uh, through a little patience, a little love, a little understanding. Never being so passive as to say, I condone your behavior in the addiction realm, but just in the everyday life, just sitting next to a person that's been sitting in the same pew for 20 years that may not even know Jesus personally, intimately. He knows about him, he knows some words, but this is what God wants in us, is this tight oneness he moves, I move. He breathes, I breathe. He speaks, I speak. That is the glory of God alive in the humanness today. Wow, that is beautiful. You know, you've blessed me, and i got to have you back on the show. Oh, but we want to talk more, especially about the, uh, the part of recovering and addiction and how the power of Christ can really uh, bring a change in their life and their thought process. You talked about the mind. And, and as you're speaking, I always think about... Um, there's a, a saying that just what God's love is, and He is a reflection, He is love. It's not just His character, and it's not, it's not just the attributes of God, but He is. He's the full essence of that love. And, and, uh, and I know that there's a saying that, um, that forgiveness mm -hmm. is what the violet shares, or the violet spread on the heel that crushed it. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's amazing when you stay in the identity of who you are. You know, yeah. no matter what happens to you yeah. on the external, you yeah. can continue to reflect God. Like you said, Him, you, yeah. Him, you. Because in Him we move. Yeah, in Him we have, have our being yeah. and yeah. so forth. So last word of encouragement, what word do you have? Just trust Him mm. with everything you got. And, it, and I say this in closing, I say, you've looked at everything else. You've tried it all. Would you give Him a shot? Because He'll radically change you radically change because mm, he loves us that much man that's awesome thank you you are god's best thank wow you. stay focused mm, wow man that's good that's good wow i'm out of time